So I'm Sean, my wife Becky, lead pastor here, uh, just welcoming you here this morning. If this is your first time here, warm welcome to you on this uh, Labor Day weekend. Also extend a welcome to you this Wednesday night. It is our first Wednesday of the month, so it's a time where we come together and we eat, and then we come together and worship and pray, and a little bit of time in God's Word, and we receive communion. So this is our primary believer service, and the way that we relate to one another as Christians is part of our gathering, so welcome to you. Hope you'll join us. Well, today we're going to be in Acts 2, if you want to go ahead and get your copy of God's Word and uh, jump there before we uh, get there this morning. Um, <clears throat> I, want to, I want to talk to you about something that's really kind of a message to the faithful folks here today. And if you're looking in on Christianity and you may go, um, man, did I pick the wrong week? No, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I, I hope we can talk and maybe you'll get some insight on why we believe what we believe and what, what is important to us. And I want to talk about that this morning, kind of some of the central things to Crosspoint and, and what, what, it, what our vision is and why we do what we do. And I was thinking about that, thinking about the Olympics, uh, just enjoyed uh, the Olympics in Paris and of course now we're in the Paralympics. And my wife and I love to watch the Olympics. One of my favorite things to watch is the uh, swimming relay. I love the swimming relay because that's where each person takes a turn and every stroke, every breath, every hundredth of a second matters. And the rest of the gang is there waiting for their turn but cheering them on and making sure they give everything every bit of their effort in their turn. I remember growing up uh, with three brothers. I was the oldest of four, and then we had another brother come in later. But as the oldest, as the first, I would often hear that mantra from my mom or dad, wait your turn. So I learned how to take my turn as a first of four, I got my turn first. So when dad would go fishing with his buddy, uh, for, and I kept waiting for my turn, and I finally got to go, but it was like Dad would say, sit in the middle of the boat and be quiet. <laughs> that, that was my turn, so I learned how to be quiet before I learned how to fish, and then finally I got my little rod and reel, and it was my turn to fish, and so I did that, and then I had my turn to drive the tractor, my turn to drive the, the car, my turn to get on the Harley-Davidson. <laughs> And I had all, yeah, it was scary. So I had all those uh, first turns. And, and then, the, you know, the, then as you move along, you kind of lose some of that zest for your first time, your first turn. And then it was like mom and dad saying, can you take your little brother to practice? And like, oh, do I have to? Yes, it's your turn. <laughs> it's your turn now. And I was going to lose some of that, that zeal for that adventure of my, it's my turn now. And even later, as my dad would go fishing, and so I'd say, do I want to sleep in or do I want to go fishing? I'll take sleeping in. So I would lose that, that zeal for my, my first turn and it would sometimes turn to, to boredom and do I have to? Yeah, it's, it's your turn. And I wonder about now, what opportunities am I missing? Because this is my turn. This is my moment. This is your moment. This is your turn now. This is Crosspoint's turn. And are we making the most of every moment? On this Labor Day weekend, as we begin a new semester, some students starting school, some entering college, some of us starting a new semester in our, this new series. I'm excited about it next week as we begin a new series. So we're beginning some new things. And I'm, I'm asking myself and us this morning, are we making the most of our moment. So I want to talk about what we're passing on, how we pass it on, and why we pass it on. So Pastor Josiah last week, a message that stirred my heart, just about sharing our faith with people who don't believe, and how we pass it on. I want to talk today about 
what it is as, as kind of a, a message to cross point, if I could just have a, a kind of a fireside chat with you and me this morning about what really matters. And as we're looking at this, I, I was drawn to Acts chapter two, and I was thinking about the first believers. Jesus has been raised from the dead. He's ascended to the Father. And before he ascends, he tells the believers, wait in Jerusalem. The promise of the Father is coming. And so they go to this upper room and they wait, 120 of them. They don't really don't know what they're waiting on. And then the Holy Spirit comes in power and fills them. And these formerly spineless, fearful disciples are radically changed. You got Peter who was fearing for his life behind locked doors and now he gets up before hundreds of people to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Something happened. Something happened to Peter. It was the gospel of Jesus Christ, the grace of the Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit and he begins to preach the gospel and tell them, Jesus has been raised from the dead, and you helped kill him. And they go, well, what are we supposed to do about that? And he was like, I'm glad you asked. Here's what you do. Acts 2 and 38, repent. Change your mind about God. Change your mind about how you think about life. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for this promise is to you, to your children, to everybody afar off. And Peter makes it clear, this isn't for a select group. This is for everybody. So as he preaches this message, they are cut to the heart, they repent, they're baptized, and that day, it says here in Acts chapter 2, those who received his word, in verse 41, those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Wow. Somebody say wow. So 3,000 people get saved, are baptized that day. Side note, baptism is not for the spiritually mature who've arrived. That day, they believed, they got baptized. There was a sense of like, this is my first baby step as a Christian. I believe I get baptized in 3,000. What a baptismal service. Can you imagine? So the disciples, they gotta be going, how many more are in the line? <laughs> I'm really getting tired. Can I take, can somebody else take a turn here to help baptize? And then what happened to these believers? What did they do with what they've been given? Well, it tells us here, they devoted themselves, verse 42, to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Awe. So this is when awesome was really awesome. Now we say awesome to ice cream, hamburgers, whatever. This is when awe was awesome. It was a sense of wow. The disciples were seeing the grace of God. The gospel at work, they were seeing a new power in preaching. They were seeing people get healed. They were seeing people change from death to life, like radical salvations. Sometimes I lose the wow, just speaking for me. Like when people come to faith, I say, oh yeah, how many got saved on Sunday? Oh yeah, oh praise God, three, you know, oh cool. 10 people got baptized. Oh, that's good. Yay. And kind of feel a little bit, but I'm not going, awesome. Wow. Amazing. What amazing. And sometimes I lose the amazing part of amazing grace. The glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there is a great God in heaven who so loved me and the world that he gave his son so that I could be forgiven and have life in him. Amen. And I'm wondering this morning if anybody else in the room would be honest enough to say sometimes I lose the wow. I'm not amazed anymore. 
I lose the, the wonder of children coming to faith, of baptisms, of new members, of a campus that God has so lovingly and graciously provided to us for us to worship in. And we aren't amazed anymore. Well, somebody says, well, uh, yeah, but, but, you know, it says here that the apostles were doing signs and wonders, and I'm not seeing a lot of that. I mean, I've not seen anybody raised from the dead. I'm not seeing blind people healed. Yes, yes, I know. We don't see those things to the same measure as the apostles did, but... We still see the evidence of the mighty grace of God, of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, and we shouldn't see it as like ho-hum. We should get the wow back, live back in the state of wow. Let's just practice this morning, just say wow. wow. Yeah, okay, yeah, wow. Wow, we get to do this. I get to get up and open this book and talk about what God has done, about what he's doing, what he's about to do. I believe I get to preach. I get to worship. I get to be with God's people. I get to be in a church where people don't just act like they love each other. They really do. Okay, that was the first service. I've been to other parts of the world. I've been to beautiful countries where there are beautiful people, but I am shocked sometimes about the things, the way they live. And they probably are shocked at us too. But it's like, you see the light change, the traffic light, nobody does anything. Or they will run red lights. And they're just all right in the middle of the, of the intersection, just like, Honking and like nobody obeys the traffic laws. And I turn on the hot water and there's no hot water. Randomly, the electricity goes out. And people say, oh yeah, that happens every day. Wow. And then open sewage in the streets. And I'm I, I look at, and again, I'm not denigrating other nations and countries, but I come back to America, and I'm just like, wow. I, I know America's got problems, amen, hallelujah. Yes, America and Washington got lots of problems, but listen, guys, it's a still a pretty awesome place to live, let's be honest that you turn on the hot water and it works. It's like electricity. I can call 911. The police will come at any time of day. Wow. I get to vote. Wow. I have, I have a house where they have indoor plumbing. I don't have to go outside to do things. I can do it inside in air conditioning. Okay, we'll stop there because we're getting too close to TMI, aren't we? <laughs> and here we see and we experience how God has led us in to a heavenly country where we are sons and daughters of the king. And we have received a gospel where God has said, you know what? I'm going to forgive you because of my son. And it's going to be like your past, all those sins you committed, they never happened. And you're going to, I'm going to give the power of the Holy Spirit who's going to live in you, and he's going to help you do things you thought you'd never do. And you would never have the power to overcome. And I'm going to work with you to confirm my word. And you're going to, I'm going to give you the grace to love people who aren't like you. Wow! See, we, it's like we go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, we need to get the wow back. <laughs> we need to get the wow back of this glorious gospel that God has given to us and seeing lives that have been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I got to pray with a guy this morning after first service who surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. 
Oh, man. I, I get to see students that come to church and they have notebooks out saying, okay, I'm going to write some stuff down. Wow. I, it's like I heard about the students a few weeks ago, Pastor TJ with our youth ministry shared this with the elders and shared it with me. I, maybe they can just show this little clip here of an impromptu worship service in a basement. Wow. Nobody told them to do it. Instead of, instead of just, you know, playing Fortnite with, with a bunch of guys, they said, you know what, let's do, let's get in one of the basements. Let's have a, let's have a testimony and prayer service. And so they went old school. They got a chair in the middle. They laid hand on each other and prayed for boldness and courage and that the Holy Spirit would, would give them grace in their new season. Wow! This revival! Come on, guys. Is it amazing or what that we have students who love Jesus? Yeah. I think about, think about Celebrate Recovery. It goes on here every week. And I saw online where some of them have been posting their stories. Uh, I don't know if Steve's here. Steve's so, uh, two years clean. Praise God. I think about Jason a few weeks ago, 11 years sober. Another guy, three years, three years, just on and on. And that's just in the last couple of months. Wow. What God is doing by the grace of God. So this is what we're passing on. This is why it's a big deal. What are we passing on? The grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes lives. And we get to pass it on. Well, how did, how did these early believers pass it on? The Spirit comes. Jesus says, it's your turn now. So what did they do? The gracious hand of God comes upon them, boldness, favor, and they continue to pass on this fervor. How did they do it? I want to take some cues from them. How did they do it? That's how we ought to do it. How did they do it? It says they devoted themselves, verse 42, to the teaching of Scripture, the fellowship, breaking of bread. They devoted themselves. This is a response to the grace of God. Breaking of bread and the prayers, and all who believed were together and had all things. What we're seeing is a response to the grace of God. We call this three C's, the C3, Connect, commit, contribute. I know some of you go, oh yeah, that's the cross point thing. Glad you guys got a program. You pastors always looking for ways to kind of do your thing. Hey, I like the alliteration. Yay, yay, yay. No, man, we do this because it's in the Bible. So we say we, com we connect together in groups because that's what they did. As a response to the gospel, what did, how did they pass it on? Well, they kept getting together. All who believed were together. Verse 46, day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. Where do you see two places here? In the temple together, okay, that's like our Sundays and Wednesdays, and in the homes, life groups. Both places, it's not one without the other. We need both. Why? Because they needed both. They attended temple together. They broke bread in their houses. So we say following Jesus means that we connect together because they did. Well, and here we go. Here's where I hear people say, well, you know, pastor, that's always in a low voice. <laughs> you know, pastor, church is not a building. I've never heard that before. Wow. It's like, yeah, I've, guess what? Here's what I would say to that. In love, a family is not a house either, but a house is sure nice to have. It's not a necessity. You can be a family and live in tents if you want to, but it's gonna be hard to have anybody come over. 
Come over to our tent today. It's 97 and 90% humidity. Ah, uh, I think I'll pass. So I know a church is not a necessity. A building is not a necessity, rather, for a church to be a church, but it sure helps. <laughs> it sure helps to welcome people in when you've got air conditioning and indoor plumbing. Wow. Wow. So when we, when we strive to have guests come and we say, please come and be with us and we've got air conditioning and indoor plumbing and free breakfast and, and padded seats, I know it's not a necessity, but it helps. I know the church is not a building, but it says they devoted themselves to meeting in the temple and house to house. Not only that, says they devoted themselves, they were committed to something. They were committed to habits, things you do every day, to the apostles' teaching. What is the apostles' teaching? It's the New Testament. John, Matthew, and so on. We know what the apostles taught when we read the New Testament. They were committed to that. They didn't have the New Testament in written form yet, but they had it verbally. And they said, man, we are committed to the scriptures. We're committed to, if it was us, we're committed to the Bible, man. We're in the Bible. We're committed to habitually looking and studying God's word. We're committed to prayer. Do we always feel like praying? No. But we pray every service. We say, here's our prayer team. Please come and pray. We pray on Wednesday nights. We pray in our life groups. Why? Because they did. We commit to the habits of a Jesus follower. This is the way we continue to pass it on because we want to be free from who we used to be. Even after we get saved, I've got some stuff that hangs on to me. I want to get free from it. So it's this way in any other kind of field of study, whether it's sports or it's the arts or it's music. There are habits you have to commit to. You can't just say, well, I just want you to know, make an announcement, going on Facebook, I am the new Michelangelo. I'm going to paint stuff, and it's going to sell zillions of dollars. Okay, well, have you ever painted before? No, but I just know I am. I'm going to be awesome. And we would all laugh at that because we say, have you ever painted before? How, what, what kind of lessons have you How are you practicing and it's that way in music. It's like my friend, Pastor Josh, so awesome on the saxophone. Have you guys heard him? Wow, he's amazing on it. Well, I've got a saxophone. It's on the shelf in my office, gathering dust. And if I were to come in and play it this morning, you all would say, God bless his heart. You know, he gets, a, he gets an E for effort. Uh, he's obviously not practiced much, but, but you would listen to Josh. you say, he's so free. It's just like it's so natural. Yes, because he's worked from the, the process of habits of doing these things consistently until he's free to play. I'm not in that place. And so it is with the habits of the Christian life. It's how we, how God by his spirit makes us free to live for him. Free from our old patterns. Free, free from our stinking thinking. Free from those thoughts and trauma that just makes us get hung up in life. And by the habits of the Christian life, staying committed to prayer, staying committed to the scriptures, staying committed to life group, committed to worshiping together with God's people, we're committed to those habits because they lead toward freedom in Christ. And that's what they did. Why? How did they do it? Well, not, not only that, not only were they committed, they were also contributing. Verse 44, all who believed were together, there's that word again, had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. So they were, as a response to grace, they said, God, you've given us so much, we're gonna overflow with compassion. 
and we're going to give our time, our talent, our resources, and that's why we say that, that Jesus' followers contribute their time, their talent, and their treasure. Why? Because these first believers did this. It doesn't save you, but it's a response to grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ, so we bring our bags by the bumper, as we will last, next week. Second service, I'm believing for you. You're gonna, you're gonna be off the chain next week. I'm still believing that there is victory for you. First service always smokes you guys. Oasis ministry, our ministry to refugees in our city. And we have so many people that are going and loving and serving and going to houses. We're the first Christians often that these people have ever met in their life. Why do we do that? We contribute our time, our talent. Our, we go to Lee May Manor and teach kids how to read. We, we, we come on Monday night and teach people how to speak English who don't know how to speak English. We do all these things because of Jesus Christ. We, we give generously so that we can fund the curriculum that's gospel-centered for our children in the church. You guys will give tens of thousands of dollars to invest in our youth camps so kids can go and experience the presence of Jesus Christ and hear the gospel. And we will give out of our resources this year about $350,000 to ministries outside these walls. Wow. wow. Listen, I know there are some pastors who make everything about money and they've got several homes in Tahiti and B Bermuda. I want to tell you, that doesn't happen here. <laughs> we pay our staff a fair wage and we try, thanks to your generosity, but that's not happening. And I know there are other churches that do that, but that doesn't mean we're doing it. So our books are open. If you want to come and see how we manage finances, Call our office. Say, I want to know. Yeah. And why do we do this? Why do we, why do we care about giving money away and using resources to fund the ministries of Crosspoint? Because God wants to add to his family. Amen. Why do we pass it on, friends? It says in, I think it's verse Verse 44, so it says, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So they're committing, they're con connecting, they're contributing, and then God gives the increase. He breathes upon it, and the church grows because God loves people, and we should too. Jesus made it clear why he came. It's no secret. He didn't come to save nice people. He came to save sinners. And you were one, you are one. He didn't come to build religious systems. He came to build relationship. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, to welcome lost people into his family. Jesus came for that reason. I, th I think it's John 15 and 7 where, where Jesus is talking to people where, where they're saying, you know, what are you about? Why, why do you? And the Jews were getting riled up because they thought he was about saving Israel. He says, no, I'm actually here to save all kinds of people. And he told parables and he said, this is what my country, my kingdom is like. And he told these stories about lost things and said, this is what it looks like when people come into my family. And he said, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 people who say, I'm good. What does heaven get excited about? One person who says, I'm in. Jesus, I want you. God, I want to be with you forever. And heaven 
As it were, I don't know how this works, but somehow there's a celebration in heaven over one person who repents. That's why we ought to get excited about people being saved and added to the family. We must pass it on. It's not enough for us to say, well, you know, we need another deep Bible study. Okay, well, we've got some deep Bible studies. Well, you know, I don't have enough friends. Can you do something about that, Pastor? Look, look, we're, we're gonna help you as best as we can, but I can't guarantee you're gonna find somebody exactly like you or you're gonna find a mate in our church. That's not why we're here. We're here to help people come to Christ and be saved forever. We're here to add people to the church, people who need a a savior, rebels, atheists, all kinds of people. God gave his son so they could know him. I got an Amber Alert this week, a couple of them. Can I just be real with you for a second? No? Okay, well, we'll pass. No, okay, I'm gonna be real anyway. For that moment, in what I was doing, I was like, What a bother. It just flashed through my mind. Until later, and I didn't even read it. I just heard that sound. And then it dawned on me later, I was going, that's somebody's kid. That's somebody's son. That's somebody's daughter. What would I do if I lost my son or daughter? What lengths would I go to? Would I care whether people were watching the Amber Alerts or not? And how I can just like be ho-hum. And not only that, but in God's kingdom about people that God loves and cares about. And that we ought to love too. Something ought to move us when we think about people that don't know Jesus who would spend eternity apart from Jesus. And there is an amber alert that God is giving us. And what are we going to do, my friends, as Crosspoint members, as people of God? So one day I was at home and I was, Becky was not in town. And so me and my dog, Odie, we were taking a long walk through the woods. And, and we were walking along and he took, this was several years ago, he took off on the trail of something. I don't know what it was. So he's wandering away, and I'm just thinking, oh, he'll come back. Well, then five minutes pass, and I'm like, Odie, Odie. And it got louder and louder. I'm like, pleading. Odie, get your tail over here. And I'm like wandering through the woods, and I start going into a little bit of panic mode, because I'm thinking, what am I going to tell my wife? And I say, I lost Odie. You what? Yeah, he was with me, and then he wasn't, and then I, well, you know, I'm thinking of all that, and even now, I'm like. (laughs) So I'm like, should I call people to have a search committee, you know, help me find my dog? I know you're thinking, what's another dog? But that's my dog. It means something to me. And so I'm wandering and I'm calling and I I get back to the house and there he is sitting on the porch. He's like, where you been? (laughs) I sat him down. I said, don't you ever do that to me again, buddy. You know how much I sweated over you in the last minute and I've like lost my voice. He said, I'll never do it again, dad, I promise. (laughs) I think about that feeling that I had about my lost dog and I'm asking, do I have any kind of sense of urgency about lost people that Jesus died for? And God is so intent, he gave his son, sent him so that they could know that God loves them. God is into saving people, all kinds of people. Can I say this in love this morning? Jesus didn't die to save America. He died to save Americans, Guatemalans, Russians, Ukrainians, illegal aliens, legal aliens, red, yellow, black, and white, light-skinned, dark-skinned, even Democrats, Republicans, and independents. 
I know I'm not getting any amens now, but listen, Jesus loves all people, and we need to love all people too. We've got to pass it on. This is why it matters. This is why we count. We count people who give their lives to Christ. We count baptisms. We don't count hands because we wanna make sure it's legit. We don't wanna give people false sense of security. This is real stuff. This is important. So we count the cards that say, I'm in, I'm, I wanna follow Jesus Christ. We count baptism, we count life group attendance. Why? Because people matter. We count how many are in life groups, how many are in outreach teams. We count them, yes, because God counts people. People count. They matter to Jesus. The Paris Olympics, a couple of weeks ago, it was an event that I, I love, and it's the men's relay, the four by 100, and they get the four fastest guys to run this relay, and each one gets a turn. And, at the, and, and then there's this critical point where they have to pass on the baton. It has to be done right. There are rules to it. You've got to pass it on at the right time. And, and, and like this picture of, and so Coleman, I think he was in the second leg. You can see him here, giving it all he's got, man. You could see his intensity. This is for the USA. I'm giving it all I got. He's got the baton in his hand, and then he's supposed to pass it off, but something happened in the handoff. He didn't hand it off right. And the same thing happened that's happened in the last 25 years for the U.S. Drop batons and penalties and they were disqualified, didn't even place because they didn't hand off, they didn't pass it on correctly. And friends, it's your turn now. You're up. This is our moment. I know some of us, you say, oh, I just, I don't like the world. I wish I was born 20 years ago, back when life was grand, or a thousand years ago, or a hundred years ago, but you weren't. This is your moment. God has chosen, according to Acts 17, he has chosen the places and times where people live. And you and I might go, I don't like the world. I, I just want to be rescued. No, this is our moment. God has called us for such a time as this. What are you going to do with your turn? Well, I'm just, you know, pastor, I'm glad you're into this. I see your passion. Cool. C3, yay, yay, yay. But I'm just, I'm just trying to get through the week. I just want a little extra money so I can go on vacation. I've got some plans for retirement and so on. So I'm just gonna take a pass. You don't get a pass because everyone will pass on something to the people around them. You will pass on your self-centeredness, you will pass on your apathy, your lack of compassion, or you will pass on a fervent gospel, a wow at the grace of God. You will pass on your talents, your time, your abilities, your resources, There is no, even when you say, you might be in, uh, say, I'm not a believer, I'm not making a decision today, that is a decision, to say I'm not. You're making a choice. And we have limited time. I don't know the boundaries of your life or mine. I don't know how many heartbeats you have. I don't know how much time you have left but you have today. We have this moment. We have this moment. This is our time, cross point. Let's maximize the moment. And you, my friend, if you haven't decided to follow Jesus, I extend a warm invitation to you. Father's arms are open. He gave his son. He came, not for nice people, but for sinners. And that's where you gotta start. You gotta say, I'm a sinner. 
I, I've fallen short of God's glory. I need a savior. I believe in him. I trust him with my life. And then you take those next steps of following him and then connect, commit, contribute. You learn how to pass on the faith that you've received. In just a moment, you'll have an opportunity to do that, to surrender your life to Christ and give him your life. But my friends, cross pointers, this is our moment. This is your turn. It's your turn now. Use it wisely. Make the most of it. Let's do this for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I'm asking by your spirit that you would seal those that are coming to faith right now. Perhaps some online, some in this room that realize that they've, they've been far from you, might even have said, I, I'm not sure if Jesus is real, but today something snapped, something changed. Give them the courage to make that choice and decision today. I invite you, friend, if that's you, that you confess your need of Jesus right now where you are. Jesus, I need you. I believe you were raised from the dead. Come into my life. Send your Holy Spirit upon me. And then be baptized. Lord, I, I pray for the saints at Cross Point that we will use our time wisely. This is our turn, our moment, that we can pass on the faith that has been delivered to us. Be faithful in it, Lord Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now, friends, if you're making that decision to follow Jesus, talk to someone. You need to, this is a together religion. You can't do it in isolation. So talk to someone in next step. There's a room right through the doors to your left. There'll be someone in there to talk with you about your next steps of faith. You need to be baptized. And those of, those of you that have not been in a life group yet, hey, there's an opportunity for you to find out about it. No pressure. We're not gonna make you sign anything. But if you wanna find out about it, classroom one and you just talk to the folks in the Welcome Center. They'll guide you. There's some folks in there can talk with you about life groups, possible places where you might, might attend and be a part of a life group. Go talk to them. Again, no pressure, but it's, it's, this is the gateway, the way for you to get in, okay? So let's do this, my friends. Thank you for being with us this morning. May the Lord bless and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Lift his countenance upon you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you, see you.